I'm about to give away all my trade secrets today, guys. So make sure you like the video. Leave me some love in the comments down below. And check out my website if you want to throw me some support as well. Hope you guys enjoy. What's up, guys? Alec on Kiri here. And I got a new series that I want to kick off here today covering the fundamental aspects of weight training. The, the basic, most important components, right? The meat and the potatoes, the primary stuff that, that's really going to dictate the majority of progress that we're all going to make over the course of our training careers. If you're new to the weight room and you consistently nail these fundamentals that I'm going to cover in this series, eventually you will be the motherfucker that people stare at when you're going beast mode in the gym. If you're a seasoned vet, then this series is simply going to serve as a, a necessary refresher course for you for the things that you already know, but that you probably need to be reminded of every now and again. So today we're going to kick things off with progressive overload. So let's jump right into it because progressive overload is the king man the king of the game with no progressive overload there there's nothing really no matter the physical endeavor it doesn't matter if it's running if it's jumping if it's swimming if it's cycling if it's lifting weights etc 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 it does not matter you improve physical fitness by utilizing the concept of progressive overload unfortunately this concept is highly misunderstood. In terms of non-weight room activities, I don't even know if most people know that it exists as a principle of fitness, of physical fitness enhancement, right? To be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> and just real quick, guys, if you're in the market for a top-notch meal prep company, then be sure to check out Flex Pro Meals and use code on Kiri Elite for 20% off your order. The link is in the description. The food's legit. It usually arrives in just a couple days. They have a bunch of different high protein meal options and it's a really easy and convenient way to help keep your diet and your macros on track. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. In terms of the weight room, which is what we're gonna focus on here today, and primarily in this series, it's often wrongly boiled down to just constantly adding more weight to the bar, right? But that is pretty freaking lame, and it's a fast ticket straight into a brick wall as well. Sure, it works for a little while, depending on how much of a novice that you are, but eventually, the things have to become a little bit more nuanced than that. Now, that's not to say that one can't use linear progressions for extended periods of time. I'm actually going to detail exactly how you can do that in today's video, and, and you most certainly can. So I, I actually believe that, that most people abandon this tried and true method way too early on in the game, right? The, the devil is in the details, however, and the trick really becomes knowing how and when to wave the training weights. Now, personally, I use six week blocks most of the time. So you wave the weights up to a point using your LP and then you come back down, but you don't come back down so far as to where the baseline was on that first wave, right? You come back down, but you stay up a little bit higher so that when you wave back up again in the next block, you wave up higher than where you started in the first block. And the magic occurs in figuring out how to most optimally stack those cycles together for the longest period of time in order to keep on coaxing your progress along, hopefully indefinitely. But beyond that, beyond merely increasing the load, you can also increase the volume, which is how much total work that you're doing. You can increase the frequency, which is how often that you're working, and you can even tinker with the exercises themselves. So these are the primary variables that we have at our disposal to, to play with in terms of inducing overload in the weight room, right? There are many other ways as well, don't get me wrong, but I, I don't wanna get bogged down in the totality of everything today because that video would take me the rest of my life to make. So I just wanna focus on these four primary variables here today. And there's a time and a place for each one. And that time and place is going to vary pretty highly from individual to individual. It's also going to depend on what your goals are, what your training age is, your training history, how the current program that you're running is set up, what exercises you're using and where you're using them, and many other factors as well. But so I, I just wanna to try to cover each of these primary variables briefly. I'm going to actually group them together where applicable. So um, volume groups up well with intensity, 
frequency groups up well with exercise variation. So that's how I'm gonna pair those, those primary variables together. We're gonna go over all of them briefly. Let's jump right into it, man. Let's start with uh, intensity here. Intensity and training volume. Now to be clear here, real quick, when I say intensity, I'm referring specifically to the weight being used, the weight on the bar. In strength training, the term intensity refers to the percentage of one RM that's being used as a training weight at any given time. This term applies whether you know your one RM, your one rep max or not. So just in case anybody was confused here, starting to get confused, this term has nothing to do with subjective perceptions of how hard you are working. I will refer to terms like RPE for that instead. RPE is rating of perceived exertion. Another metric I'll refer to frequently in this regard is RIR, which is reps in reserve. That is, how many reps did you have left in the tank after any given set? That gives you an idea of how hard you're working, essentially, how close you are to the ceiling after any given amount of exertion. So intensity, the weight on the bar. If this is the primary variable that you're trying to improve or you just want to gain, you just are, your main goal is just general strength and hypertrophy, then to induce overload, in this regard, you need to add more weight to your training exercises as you can, right? The rate at which this occurs is going to depend on your training age primarily, right? A, a more novice lifter will be able to do this more reliably in a more linear fashion. Uh, a more advanced one, it becomes more of a dubious proposition, right? So now if you are auto-regulated, instead of using a linear progression, I've talked about auto-regulation, auto-regulated progressions many times before, if you are auto-regulated, then this increase in loading, it takes place in an un unplanned fashion, right? It, it occurs gradually over time, and it's also a fluctuating process, right? So sometimes the load on the bar will be higher, sometimes it'll be lower, even from week to week. It can fluctuate, that's perfectly fine. The point with auto-regulated training is merely to have the weight trend upward over time right now contrast that with a linear progression and those weight increases they're they're actually going to be planned so we'll say i'm going to start with weight x i'm going to use that for one two three maybe even four weeks in a row and then i'm going to plan in advance to add a small amount of weight to the bar at that point typically five maybe ten pounds depending on the exercise that you're using and how strong that you are generally speaking this is a very broad rule of thumb but generally speaking for upper body movements five pound jumps are typically going to suffice whereas for lower body movements five to ten pound jumps will often be more appropriate. As mentioned earlier, these training blocks will typically be planned in advance. With the weight jumps planned in advance, I find that six week blocks work very well for this purpose. So for example, let's say we've got a guy who wants to increase his squat, right? His current best is 300 pounds. So we have him do training block one, weeks one through six, right? We have him working four sets on the squat, on his primary squat variation in the six to eight rep range. We'll have, we'll have him start with 70% of his one rep max. His max is 300 pounds, so 70% is 210, 210 pounds. And he's gonna work in that rep range, that six to eight rep range, leaving one to two reps in reserve, RIR, one to two reps in reserve on each set in week one. Now in week two, he's going to repeat that training weight, 210 pounds again in week two, and he's gonna to try to squeeze out a couple more reps here and there, maybe one rep per set, maybe two, if he's lucky. We wanna keep the RPEs about the same, maybe start to push them a little bit higher, but not much. We don't wanna be approaching failure at this point, but we do wanna to try to eke out extra reps here, here and there, where we can. In weeks three and four, he's going to jump He's gonna increase the weight. So now he's gonna to jump to 220 pounds. He's gonna repeat this process, that six to eight rep range. You're gonna establish a new RPE baseline in week three. You're gonna to try to keep those RPEs relatively the same in week four, but you're gonna to try to get in more total work. In weeks five and six, we do the same thing. Now we jump to 230 pounds, another 10 pound jump and we repeat this process again. Now we're up to about 75% of the one rep max from a starting point of 70%. After that, we move into block number two. So now we're gonna wave back down. We're gonna drop down to 220 pounds now. We're gonna stay in that six to eight rep range for our four working sets. 
and we're gonna work things again in weeks one and two, just like we did in block one. You're gonna use 220 pounds, four, four sets, six to eight reps, establish that baseline again, repeat in week two. In weeks three and four, you jump up to 230 pounds, another 10 pound jump, you repeat the process. Now, after that, we move into weeks five and six, and we finish block two a little bit higher than we finished block one. Here, we take another 10 pound jump up to 240 pounds. We get spend two weeks there, we stay in that six to eight rep range, we do four working sets again on that primary squat variation. And remember, each week that you repeat, you strive to get in more reps. Ideally, you keep those RPEs relatively equivalent across sets, comparing one week to the next in terms of the weight being repeated. You don't, you don't compare a higher intensity to a lower intensity in terms of RPE. You compare the intensities, the, the same intensity level from week to week, and you try to keep those RPEs the same at higher workloads, right? that would keep the intensity stable while increasing the total volume, thereby coaxing adaptation. Now we move into block three, and here we actually cut the reps down. So now we move down to the four to six rep range instead of the previous six to eight rep range. In this case, we're gonna take a smaller jump to start the block off. We're gonna jump up 245 pounds on the bar for weeks one and two here. This puts us a little over 80% of the one rep max. We repeat that training process that we've already discussed, establish your baseline, try to beat it, establish your baseline in the first week, try to beat it in the second week, right? Weeks three and four, you take another jump, this time a smaller jump, so we'll go up to 250 pounds now. Repeat that process, establish the baseline, beat the baseline. Another five pound jump for weeks five and six, so now you're up to 255 pounds, you repeat your process again. After that, you're ready to move into block number four. Here, you start with 250 pounds. Our hypothetical guy starts with 250 pounds, weeks one and two, he repeats the process, establish the baseline, beat the baseline, jumps to 255 in weeks three and four, and then up to 260 in weeks five and six. Now this would get you 24 solid weeks of training, right? So basically a full training cycle here. Some people are going to scoff at the, the conservative loading scheme and the relatively conservative weight increases here over the course of such a long period of time. This is about six months, but it fucking works, so fuck them. The, the beauty of a plan like this is in its long-term vision, right? It, it's not the one training cycle here that matters. It's the stacking of the cycles consistently, one after another, that creates very big adaptations in the long run. Anybody can run really fucking fast for three seconds, right? Anybody can be the hare. That, that's not what this is. I am teaching you how to be the tortoise, okay? Not the hare. Conservative blocks like this can be stacked on top of one another almost indefinitely, and they will continually nudge you along and produce high quality training for as long as you're willing to tolerate it, essentially. It's not the today, it's not the tomorrow, it's not even really the six months from now. It's the three, four, or five years from now that this type of training is striving for. And if you can put in the work with this type of long-term vision in mind, you're gonna be so fucking far and away from everybody else who was in such a big giant rush to get themselves to the top of that plateau that they've been on for the last five years now, trust me. It's also important to note that intensity is intimately intertwined with volume. That is to say, the heavier the training weight gets, the lower the training volume necessarily becomes. When the weight stays static, we strive to make the volume higher in order to keep coaxing on adaptation, right? As we just saw in our example here a minute ago. Because there, there are many ways to induce overload in the gym and coax the body into continual adaptation, right? Adding weight to the bar is a very good way to do that when it is used judiciously and appropriately. So the key part here is we have to figure out how to do it judiciously so that those weight increases actually matter and don't just throw you into your next plateau. And so you do it by increasing in a conservative fashion. And in those interim periods, it becomes more appropriate to increase the training volume first instead of the training intensity. 
And in my experience, the, the best way, so, so in my experience, the best way to guarantee a smooth transition into a higher intensity, into a heavier training weight, is to first ensure that you're capable of doing more work, a higher volume of total work at the same weight without some massive increase in the RPE, in the perceived exertion level. So as noted, you take weight X, you do the prescribed volume, and then you keep the weight at X for several weeks while attempting to increase the volume, while attempting to add one, two, or maybe three extra reps into each set that you do and keeping those average RPEs relatively equal, more or less. And, and that is a pretty surefire way to know that you are adapting to the workload and that a higher intensity level will be appropriate. You can also add in extra sets instead of adding reps to a fixed number of sets. But in my opinion, that, that's more of a way just to add volume for volume's sake, right? It's easier to add an extra set to increase the volume than it is to add volume to the pre-existing sets. So it may not indicate that you're necessarily ready for a higher intensity level just because you added in an extra set or two sets or three sets or whatever you did. This might be good for hypertrophy if you're not already working at or close to your MRV, your maximal recoverable volume. But in terms of strength and general fitness, it's going to be a less reliable way to ensure that you're ready to increase the intensity level, the weight on the bar. Lastly, before we move off the topic of uh, intensity and volume, Another way to build in progressive overload is to wave the training weights weekly, right? Well, not wave them, but increase them weekly and then drop them back down at the start of the next block. So instead of staying static and worrying about the volume, you keep the volume static and you keep increasing the intensity for several weeks before coming back down. So just for example, real quick, we're using our same 300 pound squatter. He could do his squat work instead as a static four sets of five reps, no rep range, just four by five. He could start with 200 pounds in his first week and he could add five pounds to the bar each week. By week six, that would put him at 225 pounds, the end of his first training block. He could then start his second training block, block two, with 210 pounds, 10 pounds higher than his first one. So then when he adds five pounds each week, he'll end his second six weeks, he'll end his second training block with 235 instead of 225. So he would wave up and down cyclically like that, in this case, with a static training volume in the sessions. And that leads us to our next bit, which is frequency and exercise variation. In terms of training frequency, you only have so many days in a week, right? So much time that you can commit to training and so many resources to allow you to recover from that training. So this variable is capped pretty early on just by default, <laughs> excuse me. But increasing frequency is still a good way to nudge progress along. You, you just have to know how to do it appropriately. So you do this by allowing the body to adapt to higher workloads and then strategically lowering those workloads to strategically detrain the body from a particular exercise or movement pattern in order to make it ripe again to adapt to an increase in frequency down the road. So this is going to entail aspects of tinkering with the frequency, but also with tinkering with the exercises, utilizing exercise variation to your advantage to go along with those increases and decreases in frequency. So let's stick with the same example we've been using, our 300 pound squatter. He just wants to become a, strong, a stronger squatter, right? So in this case, let's say in blocks one and two of our previous example that we discussed in the previous point. He had been doing his, his back squats with that protocol that I described before, four sets of, of six to eight reps. Now that would most likely be his, uh, his first lower body training session of the week. This guy is an intermediate lifter, right? So he, we can get away with less intense work less weight on the bar relative to the 1RM at this stage in the training career. So his first training session, his primary squat day, he was doing four sets of six to eight reps in blocks one and two of his training cycle. Now, we, he, he would have had a second training session for the lower body later in the week, even in those first two blocks. So maybe in that session, we had him doing just some generalized lower body movements to, to supplement all that. So maybe he was doing some hack squats to hit his quads, maybe some hyper extensions, maybe some RDLs, whatever, just some other random lower body movements. It doesn't really matter for this purpose. What matters is knowing that 
Now, as things are intensifying over the course of the training cycle, as the bar weight is getting heavier, we, when we move into blocks three and four, right? Now, you can start to use specific increases in frequency to your advantage, Sp specific frequency increases to your advantage. So, so now, in that second lower body day later in the week, maybe we replace the hack squat with something that is more specific to the exercise that he actually wants to improve, which is his, his primary back squat, right? So in this case, we could replace the hack squats with pause back squats or with pin squats or with more just regular old back squats. This would be the secondary training session. And so the loading protocols and the set and rep parameters would have to be designed around this idea. But now you have added an ACE card into the mix, right? Suddenly you have bumped up the frequency of task specific work that also increases the volume of task specific work. And this is going to coax continual further adaptation. But here, it would also be important to use that variety to your advantage as well. So let's say I had him do pin squats in his secondary squat session in block three. I might switch that out after just six weeks. So by the time he enters block four, I might take the pin squat out and replace it with a pause squat instead. All the while, he is still doing his regular primary back squat work in his primary lower body training session earlier in the week. But now we've got this additional stimulus that we've added in coaxing things along. And that stimulus is changing relatively frequently as well. So that's going to constantly keep things fresh and exciting. And it's going to provide the body with a new stimulus that it needs to acclimate to all the time. And this work is highly specific as well. So the carryover to the primary desired movement is also going to be very high. Finally, after block four wraps up, the training cycle is gonna end, right? So we wrap up block four, now it's time to deload and then prep for another full training cycle. So now, what do we do? This is where that strategic detraining comes into play. So now you can pull out that specific, that more specific squat work from the secondary training session to, that takes place later in the week. And you can switch it out for something more generic again instead. So you could go back to leg machines. Maybe now you do a leg press, something like that. Or you could pull this workout all together for a period of time just to bring the body's expected workload back down to something that's easier to maintain. If you can hold here, which would be the goal, you hold here for a couple training blocks and you maintain your gains at this total lower workload. So now you have the same level of fitness, but you have it at a lower level of maintenance. So then when we need the boost again, we strategically re-implement that increase in frequency once again. And after several months of reduced frequency, the body will be ripe again to be pushed into further and further adaptation at this once again higher threshold, at, the, at this greater total workload. Whew. So there you have it guys. That is uh, volume, intensity, frequency, and variation all condensed into a singular example about how to improve your squat. Specifically, you could apply that concept to any movement, exercise, whatever that you want to improve. You can take these protocols and you can convert them into hypertrophy oriented training or strength oriented training or power building. For those of you who are about that, you can use it to accomplish whatever weight room oriented goal that you want to. So I hope that makes sense. I'm going to run through this video and edit this thing and I'm going to add in some illustrations, some pictures here after the fact that hopefully make the examples much, much more clearer than they felt like they were when I was saying them. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to fire away in the comments. I'm giving away the trade secrets right here, guys. If you actually sit here and piece this thing together, I have literally described you exactly how I would plan out an intermediate squat cycle. I have done this more times than I can remember for more people than I can remember. And we bumped up I don't know how many thousands of pounds onto people's lifts with these protocols. It, it's not what I intended this video to be when I sat down to make it, but it, it's what came out. So I hope you guys find it useful and informative. Anyway, like I said, I just gave away the kitchen sink, guys. So, hey man, if you wanna help keep this channel alive, feel free to throw some support my way. You can actually leave tips now directly here on YouTube. It's called a super thanks. 
I appreciate anyone who does that. Or you can just check out my website, man, on careelitefitness.com. Pick up one of my training programs. Uh, most of them are similar to some of the protocols that I described in, in today's video, at least my intermediate program and my novice program are. And I've sold a few thousand of them, man, a few thousand of them over the last few years since I released them. And the gains that people have been reporting back to me have been freaking awesome, dude. So be sure to grab yours, hop on the gains train. I've also got a Patreon if you're interested in that. I post other exclusive content on there as well. And if you enjoy these types of videos or you simply find them informative, please remember to hit the like button and leave me some love in the comments down below as well. The engagement is really helpful for my channel. It is much appreciated, guys. Anyway, that's all I got for today. Keep training hard. I will catch you guys next time.